today's World Insights. The WHO on top of the COVID-19 epidemic, the dangers and pitfalls of containment efforts, and the words of a WHO rep who led a joint team to China. It really saw me, help me see another side of WHO um, after 30 years of working here. And music coupled with nature, a band leader and a naturalist tells us the importance of both in times of crisis. And here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insights, coming to you from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. We begin today's program with ongoing efforts to contain the COVID-19 spread. While China is holding the trenches against the epidemic, the rest of the world is starting to grapple with its own rapid spread on their home soil. So how can the world effectively deal with the crisis all together? Dr. Bruce Aylward, a WHO epidemiologist who led the China WHO joint mission on COVID-19, told me in an exclusive interview that collective international research can speed up control of the outbreak. As a frontliner who took part in research on Zika, Ebola, and yellow fever, he said the world had gone faster in viral research and sharing the data. But certainly, there are more we could do to stop its spread. For more, joining us in Geneva, Bruce Aylward, the WHO epidemiologist who also led the WHO-China joint mission on COVID-19. Dr. Aylward, welcome to CGTN. Thank you very much, Wei. Uh, Dr. Aylward, this is a complicated world. Uh, with an epidemic, there's also geopolitics. Are you afraid that people accuse you of doing propaganda for China? Um, people, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, we were very careful writing the report that we we avoided hyperbole, even though as individuals, um, many of us had not worked in China for some years, and we, we were really struck by both the sophistication of the public health work and of the health uh, system, also of technology and how it's used in China. We were struck by that. Um, we were also struck by the Chinese people, uh, you know, um, really, really wonderful uh, people, a wonderful society. But we had to take that out of the report um, because the report was not about hyperbole. It was about the science. And mm. what we tried to focus on were things we observed that can help guide the global and national response. And we were never speculated. We always tried to find three or four data points that would support key observations from multiple angles. Um, so it's interesting, despite that, um, or maybe as a result of that, pe people some people have said I, I, I've praised China, but when I, when I asked them objectively, where in the report do you see praise? I mean, <laughs> you're reading praise out of very objective data, and that's a different thing. And, and mm -hmm. I, w I was pleased to see that because, y you know, you have to respect the achievements um, uh, of, of countries and of, of people, especially in the face of something well, so scary and dangerous as, as, as this situation was. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, uh, some people have, have uh, they, they, they walk a fine line with me on this now, and, and um, I, I think people, the power of our report is that it, it's not a, a media piece with full respect to the media, um, and it is not an advocacy piece or propaganda piece. Mm -hmm. It is simply an explanations of facts and their implications. Mm -hmm. um, what people challenge is, can our societies do that? My response to that way is, look, I'm, I grew up in the West, and I keep hearing we have the best system in the world. You know, rather than beat up China's, why don't we prove it if ours is better? <laughs> Let's see what we can do when the chips are down and we're facing a dangerous disease. You know, I'm not going to make a judgment. Let's see how we take care of our people. Exactly. Because in China, they're trying to do that. And, and by the way, so now China versus the rest of the world is rather China with the rest of the world. That is the uh, logic here. Absolutely. And again, it was one of those things that inspired me, how much the people of China felt accountable for a global situation and, and helping on that. 
And whether it was the docs saying, look, we want to share our information, we're publishing it, we're pushing it out so people can see it and, and share it. The pride they took in their achievements and their ability to share it. Earlier, you were participating, if I remember right, in Zika virus research, Ebola, yellow fever. You were also a Dustin Hoffman figure in the movie Outbreak. I'm sure you witnessed many of the previous cases. What about this time? Can we do it better? Yeah, so my first observation way would be we're getting better at research in emergencies. What do you mean and, by that? Um, a lot of credit goes to the re what, what I mean is we're getting more organized. Um, we're understanding what are the key questions that need to be answered, and we're trying to coordinate um, and cooperate much more quickly on that. We're sharing the results much more quickly than in the past. Major journals are not holding and taking long terms of review things. They're sharing it. So um, we're also setting up what we call R&D blueprints around every major crisis. And this is an initiative WHO learned out after Ebola, where we bring together the top researchers, set the top questions, and try and direct money and resources at those key questions. So in those ways, we're getting better. But we can do better, and this uh, still, and this, um, and, and, and this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, crisis really demonstrates that. Um, right now, if you look at the research around, um, around uh, COVID-19, it, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. Thousands of flowers blossoming, yes, let's indeed. say, in terms, of, uh, in terms of this. There's research being done everywhere. But um, the problem is, for a lot of policymakers, they're bewildered by the number of studies that are being proposed. So one of the things we tried to do when we were in China was to say, look, these are the things you have to have. These are the ones that are nice to have. It's great that we're doing the research, but from the center, in a, in a crisis like this, you have got to be focused on, um, uh, what was the term they used in the U.S., uh, the moonshots, you mm -hmm. know, those, those big uh, 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 initiatives. So whether it's a serologic test, whether it's testing some of the, not every antiviral, but the ones that we know have actually got promise, you know, get those at the top of the list. Because right. what's happening is, um, and, and even in China we're seeing this, although there's lots of, uh, uh, of people suffered from, from, from COVID in the country, cases are dropping very quickly, so there's not a lot of patients to enroll in trials. And if the patients aren't getting enrolled into the right trials because there's so many different trials going on, mm -hmm. you're not going to answer the key questions. Similarly with the public health research. So we can still do better. And this is where, you know, central authorities are so important um, to coordinate that research. And in China, one of the big learnings I had on, on, on this trip that I was really impressed with is everybody thinks of the central control of China, but people forget how um, diverse the provinces are, how talented they are, how much expertise is and how much mm -hmm. is happening at the provincial level. Yeah. So it's very, it's a big challenge in a country the size of China to really promote those key moonshots that are critical. So we're getting better at the research in crises. We're getting better at, we're faster at doing it, faster at funding it, faster at sharing it. But yeah. um, we're, we're still, uh, there's still some things we could do to prioritize the most important things. Uh, Dr. Aylward, before we go, I do have some minor question for you, but also important. I mean, when you were in China together with the rest of the international team members, uh, what was it like for you to communicate with the headquarters, with Dr. Uh, Tedros, for example, at the WHO in Geneva, or, and also with your local team here in China. I mean, for you, this must be a very intense time, but at the same time, how does WHO work in that sense? Well, um, the amazing thing about Dr. Tedros is uh, he doesn't communicate with you when you're running an independent mission. <laughs> Dr. Tedros did not read the report until he received it from us. He did not comment on preliminary drafts. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, I cannot interfere with, if I even read it, I'm going to have a comment that could influence things. And he said, you have to do, you know, the team has to do its work and then we will get the report and I will publish it immediately because the world needs to see what, what they think. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Tedros is, is courageous like that when he will support China, which he did and he continues to do. But um, if there's going to be an independent panel that in, in includes experts from around the world, he, is, he sees a huge responsibility uh, in, in, in making sure he doesn't interfere with that process, and he didn't.
Mm. Our local country team, um, I, 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 you know, I'm going to sing their praises like I do of, of others that I met um, in China. We would not have been successful without huge help from the National Health Commission, obviously, and, and the government of China to make sure we could get where we wanted, see what we needed to see, et cetera. But also our country team was so helpful in helping us with a lot of really basic logistics. You know, we had to sleep somewhere. We had to be able to get to meetings. Right. We had to be able to work with the NHC. We had to be able to access information. And um, again, they, uh, they had, they've been living this disease, so they have strong opinions. And about it, and they have lots of ideas, but they never ever force those ideas on us. Um, would only answer questions, and uh, it really saw me helped me see another side of WHO um, after 30 years of working here, and yeah. uh, and I, I was impressed, impressed as well. And final question for you, uh, Dr. Aylward. Uh, you've been also uh, during that trip interacting with Chinese medical workers. And I also understand you had previous experiences with them as well on different occasions. Uh, so what was that working style with them? Meanwhile, the medical workers in China have been devoting themselves, their lives, to the front line. So what was your personal interactions with them like? So I, I, uh, in the course of my career, I, I, I had the... Uh, uh, privileged to work in China um, a few times, uh, but many years ago as part of another uh, um, um, uh, important disease. And at that time, it was the initiative to eradicate polio, where again China did a, a, a stunning job. But um, and and so I came back 25 years later to really work at a province level again, and not just with clinicians, but also with public health workers. So clinicians, public health workers, and caregivers um, like nurses, etc., who play such important roles. And um, how far the country has come in in, in two decades is is, is stunning. Uh, when I was there uh, the previous time, I was always impressed by how hard people worked, how open they were, um, how eager to learn, how eager to share. But uh, now the level of sophistication. I mean, China was always uh, 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 so promising, but. It, it really is not world class, but world leading uh, uh, now. And so I was impressed with the humility of the people I worked with, with how hard they worked, and also with um, how eager they were to share and 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 uh, and the pride. But it wasn't an arrogant pride; it was a very modest pride and sense of responsibility. Uh, again, I used the word earlier. I, I left um, inspired and with mm. a deep admiration for uh, you know the common Chinese people. Uh, that, that I worked with. You said uh, the other day, behind every window. Oh, one last point way about that. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. One last point before we talk about that was, um, you know, I worked hard when I was in China, and I work hard since I'm back. You know, I was sleeping two hours, three hours uh, a night for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. but. Um, the Chinese colleagues were working so much harder, and it, one of the things that I, I keep telling my, my, my colleagues here is every time we got on a plane or on a train or on a, in a, you know, a little bus or a van, mm. when I would turn around to ask one of my Chinese colleagues something, you know, they were, they were fast asleep they, they, because they're exhausted. They're working such hard, long hours. You know, they would grab a, a wink of sleep wherever they could. Um, and it just reminded me again and again uh, of how hard they're working uh, and that incredible sense of duty to save lives in the country. You are too, sir, I have to say, because a lot of people know about your name now in China. By the way, before we go, I do want to reflect back about uh, one report who, which uh, quoted you as saying, you know, inside every building in Wuhan, behind every window uh, in Wuhan, there are people who are trying to do their best in order to fight this fight. And now I, I, I'm wondering, when are you going to come back and see these people in person? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was really touched uh, in in Wuhan. Um, you know, the real heroes of this response are, are, are those people. You know, sitting home in in in, in skyscrapers and, and and apartment buildings um, for weeks on end. And you know, the few that I did meet, they said, you know, we're playing our role. We're doing our part. And 
that is so powerful, and, and, and the world just owes such a huge debt to the people of Wuhan. And I just, I just wanted the people of Wuhan to know that the world knows that, and we're sharing that story. Mm -hmm. um, what you're doing is so important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we get this under control, <laughs> I'd be delighted to come back. <laughs> but we have a lot of other places to get dealt with. I but, know. Uh, um, no, you leave a little bit of your heart in, uh, in China, and especially in a place like Wuhan at a yeah. time like this. You're welcome back when it is the right time, when time is ripe, as they say. Thank you so ah, much. Xie xie. Xie xie nian, xie xie. Dr. Bruce Aylward, <laughs> the WHO epidemiologist who also led the WHO China Joint Mission on COVID-19. Thank you so much, sir. Really appreciate it. Do get a little sleep if you can. Thank you, Wei, and thank you for what you do. Um, journalists and people with a platform like yours are so important to this disease. It's what the population knows, what they understand, and understanding it accurately, because the population is what's going to stop COVID. Um, not the doctors, not the nurses. We deal with consequences. It's, it's your population and people like you are telling them what to do that are so important. So thank you for everything you do as well. Thank you, Bruce. Hope to talk soon. Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. A little effort goes a long way amid the COVID-19 outbreak. Music of support from around the world are bringing comfort to people in Hubei and around China. In Switzerland, a pop band named Stevens turned their good wishes into a music video. The band, which toured China last year, recently composed a new song called China is Strong, dedicated to beating the global epidemic. The music video was posted by the Swiss Embassy in China on Weibo, cheering on Chinese people battling the outbreak. Hey China, we love you, and with this song, I want to give you As COVID-19 spread to more than 70 countries, the band's home country, Switzerland, has also recorded more than 15 known cases. Facing a common threat to humanity, music has indeed become the universal language. In an exclusive interview with Yvon, the band's founder, he told me the story behind the work with a message of love and hope, something as simple as China, Jiao. Yvonne, good to see you finally. Ni hao, China. Ni hao, Yvonne, <laughs> in Geneva. So, we all heard your song, such a lively, rhythmic, vitality song. Tell me more about it. Well, we were in touch with uh, the Chinese people, uh, also from the Swiss embassy, who told us about this, um, this phrase that you pronounce in China, which is uh, Chungguo Jiayo and uh, Wuhan Jiayo. <laughs> and um, I was thinking, uh, since we really love China and we wanted to give the, bring our support, I was thinking about uh, uh, doing a little song, you know, a bit more positive, because... I know there's a lot of also sad songs that are spread on internet in China and I wanted to also uh, just say okay guys let's go together and also let's believe in the the nice issue of uh, of this uh, of this uh, virus and yeah. so we did this song with a, a rhythmic sound and um, that's about it But, you know, who yeah. came up with the lyrics and why did you guys uh, wanted to do this song? Well, you know, uh, about two years ago, um, no, no one of us went to China, you know. And um, the Swiss Embassy and Alliance Francaise, have a, they have a, a festival called Marc Sans Folie. And last year we were invited to, to do uh, 10 concerts in China. 
and we had such an amazing experience with Chinese people and the, and the country, the, the food, the, 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 the culture, you know, that um, I don't know, there is something particular with China and um, we, we felt very concerned also about this coronavirus since you are such a big, big country with so many people. Um, we felt uh, the need to, uh, to give the support and uh, to do it in a, in a nice way and I did the lyrics. Uh, I didn't think too much about the lyrics. It's Chungo uh, Chayo, Wuhan Chayo and then say that China is strong and China will, will survive. Uh, and uh, the rest of the world will survive to the coronavirus. Yeah. We just have to be patient and, uh, and to do the necessary to avoid the fast spreading of the virus. I especially love that cat, the cat that has been waving its arms. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. Exactly. There's a, I'm there's a bad a, cat. I'm a bad cat. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, element, in it, but there's a you, you know, cultural element, but also a lot of energy in that specific gesture. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the, it, was, it was nice because uh, the person from Sina, um, the social network, uh, asked us also to do some, take some images, and I went to my guitar player, Jan Secrest, that's his name, and uh, his girlfriend is a big, big fan of cats, so they have like five or six cats. So uh, we came up with this idea to, you know, just tung go cha yo, and the poor cat is a bit like he doesn't really understand. But yeah. I mean, now he's a superstar in China, so it oh, was worth yeah. it. <laughs> uh, you know, we laugh, we laugh at this moment, uh, Yvonne. Because we together <laughs> experienced it so much over the past two months, to say the least. But it's important from time to yeah. time that we have a laughter, yeah. right? And we know there is something stronger here inside than the pressure and the challenges from outside and from the virus. Yeah, of course, but uh, I mean, uh, you see in Switzerland, they forbid now all the concerts and all the gathering of maximum uh, 1,000 people. Mm. If it's 1,001 person, the show is, uh, is cancelled. Mm. Uh, so we have the same thing, uh, for example, Le Salon de l'Auto, you know, the, the car uh, saloon, <laughs> um, is like 35,000 people, so they cancelled it, you know. Yeah. And I think it's important that everybody also knows and realize that it's an important and dangerous virus. People die of this virus, but it's not more dangerous than the classical uh, um, uh, seasonal flu, you know. And all the specialists are here also just to remind to people not to panic and uh, we have to be careful, everybody has to be careful, but um, I am, since the beginning of that flu, of that coronavirus, uh, I have been really positive about the, the issue. And uh, you see, what we experience now in Switzerland is exactly the same that you in China experienced one month ago. We start to realize that every day there's more and more cases. Yeah. So some people are panicking, you cannot buy masks in pharmacy. There's no more, no more items of it. And some people are just taking the situation slowly and just uh, um, believe in, in good faith, you know? Mm. It's it going to be fine, I'm sure. Mm. With yeah. artists like you guys, we will be fine. I think there's something about inner heart and the inner strength that could help us. <laughs> go through these kind of difficult times. It's true, isn't it? It's a united front, absolutely. And uh, it's also interesting to know that some people were saying we have to close the, the borders of the country and all. And this is ridiculous. We, we cannot do that now. It's also here to remind us 
that um, the economy is always so fast, we are always looking so much for uh, 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 gaining uh, money and all. Now with this virus, uh, there's some economical um, consequences that are not good, but I think it's also a good time to think about how the world has evolved and the pursuit of uh, money, 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 and now we just have to relax, stay home, read a book, and uh, have a, a good Swiss cheese fondue. <laughs> and I think it's also important to have that kind of moments uh, in our uh, societies. Yeah. But um, Yvonne, would you like to tell us about yeah. What is your plan? I mean, as an artist, you know, going through this very special period of time and seeing people's life changed, life lost, but also family, more reunions, um, more warmth, more yeah. greetings, more care yes. for one another. What was it like for you as an artist? to go through this period of time? It is, it is very inspiring because we, we, you know, for example, we are going tomorrow for a one month tour in South America and uh, yet the virus hasn't been very big there. We don't know how it's going to uh, evaluate. But uh, again, as I told you before, it's, it is very sad for the people who lose their lives during that period of time, but it's also important to realize some things, you know, and see how people maybe reconnect, yeah. or the other people who say, do not come close to me, you have the virus, you know. So uh, you can see when there is crisis like that, you can really see what's in, people, in people's mind, you know, mm -hmm. and you can see the, um, I think the, the, the honesty of, uh, of, uh, of people. So it's, it's very inspiring and we, we love to go around the world to travel. They say, Yvonne, it's a test at a time of a disaster of this scale. Mm. It's a test of a lot of things, of our capabilities, of our resolve and of our, you know, sincere feeling toward one another. I guess it's so, isn't it? Absolutely. I feel the same. Um, I don't know if I can say that I believe in God, but I really believe in the uh, uh, universe, you know. Mm. And um, I mean, I didn't wait for the coronavirus uh, to happen to think that sooner or later we, we are going to pay. And it's already started with uh, all the uh, natural catastrophe, uh, and uh, the lack of water in this planet. I mean, nature will always be stronger than uh, humankind. Mm -hmm. So eventually we have to pay and uh, think about it and think of about uh, the possible changes, you know. And yeah. uh, the young people, I really hope the young people are going to make the difference. Yvonne, let me ask you about your band. I mean, in order yeah, to yeah. have this social distancing, <laughs> You guys are really scattered around. Four people band, and you have four people at four different places. How are you likely to band and practice rehearsal? Yeah, we don't practice. <laughs> 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 no, but now we, we know we know the we know the song. You know, since uh, it has been a certain while, and um, in uh, in South America we are only going uh, as an electro duo yeah. with Jan, the guitar player, and me. But um, when we came to China, we were also with CJ, the bass player, and Leo, uh, the drummer, uh, that maybe you, you saw in the, in the video. We see them a little bit. And uh, hopefully when we come back to China, we will come, um, all of us, the four people, because uh, it's also good to be all together, you know. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the final triumph yeah. of human being over the virus. At that time, we really need some of your music to yes. have some disco and sweat it out. And if we can help people and also help ourselves to, uh, to dance and to laugh and to have a little...
cool time in this difficult period, mm. then it's mission accomplished. <laughs> mission accomplished. Looking forward to it. Together, as you say. Yvonne, what a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, maybe and I all say... the best with you guys in China and Chungo uh, <laughs> Chai. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Chungo <laughs> Chai. Wuhan Chayo. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Welcome back. This is World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. With fears of a rising global epidemic, if not a pandemic, there are hard questions to ponder. How far could this virus go? Can humans learn to deal with nature's wrath? Can humans learn to coexist with nature? We may find some clues with Jane Goodall's story, the famous English primatologist and also anthropologist. Her story being alone in the African forest, living side by side with chimpanzees, has spread far and wide. She made us realize the planet should not be dominated just by humans, but its homes we need to share with all the other creatures. That simple message is more easily said than done. That's why Miss Gudo spends much of the year traveling around the world. Even now, in her 80s, she never tires to advocate, advocate, and advocate for conservation. Now, let's meet her, Jane Gudo. Whoever that is, whether chimpanzee or human being, they all have their very different personalities. Absolutely. So, what exactly is this special relationship you had with Mr. David Greybeard, the well, chimpanzee? David Greybeard was the first chimpanzee who lost his fear of this peculiar white ape, which is what I was. They'd never seen a white <laughs> ape before. And so gradually, because he got used to me, I'd approach a group in the forest and they were all ready to run as usual and then they would see David sitting calmly and they'd look from him to me and back and I suppose they thought well she can't be so dangerous after all so he really introduced me to his friends out in the forest David was gentle really he was a born leader not because he was aggressive in getting to the top but because he was so quick to reassure that the young ones would want to follow him just because he was a good chap to be around. Did you try to communicate with him about that community that which you became part of? No, you can't. I never tried to communicate with them. On the other hand, on one occasion when I was following him through the forest, I thought I'd lost him. And then I, I came, I had to crawl through this tangle of vines and stuff. And he was sitting almost as though waiting for me. And so I sat down near him, and there was a ripe palm nut on the ground, so I held it towards him, and he turned away. He obviously didn't want it, so I put my hand closer, and he looked directly into my eyes. He took the nut, he dropped it, he didn't want it, but very gently squeezed my fingers. That's how chimpanzees reassure each other. So in that one moment, we communicated with each other, in a language that surely predates human words. Have you ever seen him again once you left? He died before I left. I mean, I was at Gombe from 1960 to 1986. I was at, at, in the forest most of that time. And already David had, he disappeared during an epidemic of, of something like pneumonia. Are you a member of the community you were no. thinking? Or you were a researcher whom they took as a member of the community. No. Have you drawn that line always clear or it's actually very blurred? The line between us and them is very blurred. But I never tried to get into their community. I just wanted their trust so that they let me. It was like sitting and um, almost looking through a window. They trusted me. They knew I wasn't a member of their community. I didn't try and communicate with them. Um, but they didn't mind me wandering about. I wasn't harming them. And so I was able to learn the secrets of their lives. I think I learned about that as a child when I was up in my tree daydreaming. 
up as close to the birds as I could get, out with my dog, watching birds. We had a little wilderness near us. So out in the forest, I didn't really learn much about myself, but I did have opportunity to feel one with nature. And that was just a magical feeling. I think it comes close to Zen meditation. When you have a moment to yourself, when you are visiting Gombe, what would you do? Well, I visit Gombe twice a year and I always go out in the forest and I always insist on one day when I'm out in the forest by myself to renew my spirit. It's, it's spiritual food for me to be out in that forest that I love so much. So what was it like for you as a researcher in the wild in Africa at that time? As I got to know the chimpanzees better, and could sit with them for long hours, and then they began to allow me to actually follow them. It was, it was a, a, the attainment of my childhood dream. It was very hard work. The country at Gombe is very hilly, so there's a lot of climbing steep slopes and quite often losing the chimpanzees. We now have African field staff to help, and they're really, really, really good at climbing up and down there the steep slopes, but I did my best, was very often with chimpanzees all day. And I especially loved following mothers and their families and watching the development of infants and learning that there are good mothers and bad mothers, <laughs> just as there are in human society. What are good mothers and bad mothers acting like? Well, the good mother is protective, but not overprotective. She's affectionate, she's playful, Above all, most important, she's supportive. And she will run in to protect her child even though she may get into trouble herself. And that was exactly like my mother. At the time when you were doing the research, there was also debate going on elsewhere in the world when you are bringing out some of the details of your research and observations. People are saying, well, it's not academic enough. Others are saying, well, she probably has different purposes when she went into the wild. There, are also, there were also others saying, well, you know, she's got just the opportunity that none of us could have access to. Therefore, she's got what she had. I was described as the geographic cover girl. That's how I was described. And I remember that title. Yes, she's, um, she's got there because you know, she's not bad looking and so it, her research is useless because she's too anthropomorphic. But you see, fortunately, I never wanted to be a scientist. When I went out to Gombe, I hadn't been to college. I didn't know what was going to happen. I saved up my money. I got to Africa. I had this luck or whatever of meeting Louis Leakey and he's the one who gave me this opportunity to go and be with chimpanzees. So at that time, I didn't have another world. But after about two years, Lewis wrote to me and said, I won't always be around to get money for you. You're going to have to get a degree. We don't have time to mess about with a BA. You're going to have to go straight for a PhD. <laughs> I've got your place in Cambridge University. Wow. Uh, I, uh, to do a PhD in ethology. I didn't even know what ethology was. I'd never <laughs> been to college. So when I got there, I was a bit nervous, as you can probably imagine. And to be told by these professors that I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. They should have had numbers. That would be scientific. I couldn't talk about them having personalities, minds capable of thought, and certainly not emotions, because those were unique to humans. But luckily, as a child, I had a teacher who taught me that for all their learning, these professors were completely wrong. And that teacher was my dog, my dog, Rusty. And you can't share your life in a meaningful way with a dog or a cat or a rabbit or a horse, I don't care what it is, and not know that, of course, animals have personalities, but thank goodness, because chimpanzees are biologically so like us, I was able to break that, break that perception and help people, including science, to realize 
we are part of and not separated from the rest of the animal kingdom and we should treat the other animals with a lot more respect and understanding. Should we focus our attention on one species for campaigns so that people pay attention to this species and the protection of it? Therefore, more attention will be paid to nature conservation. Or we need to spread our attention, our resources, to more species and yet less focused when it comes to campaigns. I think the lucky thing is that different people are passionate about different <laughs> animals. And there's enough money out there and enough resources, and especially our young people, our roots mm. and shoots groups, high school, university, mm. they're actually doing an awful lot yeah. for particular animals. And you know, who are we to say this animal is more important than that? Mm. Fortunately for me, Chimpanzees live in the rainforest, like the orangutans and the gibbons. Mm -hmm. And if we protect the rainforest for the chimpanzee home, we're protecting the home of hundreds and thousands of other species as well. And that's always good. And usually, if you protect the habitat for this particular species, you are helping many other species mm -hmm. as well. There are debates. For example, panda, the giant panda getting a lot of attention, a lot of resources for protection, not only here, all over the world. Is that the best way? Well, a, I know there's a lot of controversy about pandas, and now people are making money. You know, pandas are exported to zoos who pay huge amounts of money to have them because people go to see them. So, in a way, you can say they're being exploited. And I definitely, definitely think that efforts to conserve the panda in the natural habitat are good. And if one way is to get money from pandas going off to America and getting hundreds of thousands of dollars to have the panda over there, if it's going to be looked after well, and if that's going to help the pandas in the wild, then, then I think it's not a bad thing. I don't mm. think captive pandas are very unhappy if they're kept in the right environment. Thank you so much, Dane, for being with us. Well, thank you for inviting me to your program. Jane Goodall's story. And that's all we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Insights CGTN, into your search engine, or check out our YouTube channel, Twitter, and Facebook accounts. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on our team, thanks for watching. Bye for now. <laughs>